Big show, happy Monday. Uh, I'm going to try not to be ageist on today's program, but it's not going to be easy. It's not looking great for a couple of goats. Speaking of animals, the hawk hath landed. That's right, Andrew Hawkins and I are going to go crazy recapping the fun of week seven. Let's hit it. My Chicago Bears probably going to get shellacked by the Patriots defense, of course. But let's talk about last night because don't do not sleep on this Dolphins team. We liked him in the beginning, wrote them off when Tua got hurt. But he made his return. Tonga Bailoa back in action last night, getting the Dolphins to win. Miami moves to four and three. Happened to be my two favorite numbers. And by the way, they are four and zero oh when Tua starts and finishes the game. Yes, there were some lulls in there, especially in the second half. But he was sharp enough to get it done early, right? He got them to a huge lead, 13 zip out the gates in the Dolphins defense. They got to go win. They're like a locomotive down there in Miami. I liked it. The shots looked beautiful on Sunday Night Football. I was like, I want to be in Miami uh, enjoying that. Uh, they intercepted, you know, who didn't want to be there, Kenny Pickett. Who doesn't? Kenny Pickett looked great at times. He really did, but he likes to take risks and turn the ball over. Three interceptions. Uh, and yeah, I think a bunch of you people watching this show jumped off the Dolphins bandwagon after two was injury. But with that win, Miami already back on the right side of the playoff picture. And I don't think they're going anywhere as long as number one stays healthy. So that's my big takeaway from last night. Andrew Hawkins is here in studio. I haven't seen him yet. I'm told he's here. I got to tell you guys, I can't hear anything in my ear. Oh, I'm not hearing program. Like if there's music or anything, I don't hear anything. I didn't hear our show open. I didn't hear the animation. Just letting you guys know in case anybody needs to talk to me. If stuff, if stuff goes down, I don't hear I have anybody. All right, but uh, maybe it's because I'm old and I can't hear. But I'm just about as old as these two old Gs. That, uh, <laughs> listen, it's not looking good. Oh, Gs, oh boy. Because we are almost at the halfway point of the season. There's a lot left to go. And when it comes to Tom Brady, and Aaron Rodgers, I'm, for one, finding it very difficult to R-E-L-A-X, very difficult to relax after a brutal 21-3 loss at the hands of the Panthers. The Panthers, who have a fire sale, who got rid of everybody, all right? The Bucks have fallen, my friends, to three and four. Brady has a losing record through seven. Read it and weep. It's the first time it's been the case in 20 years. The last time it happened, it was 2002. Did they make the playoffs that year? Nope, they didn't. Rogers, yeah, Rogers now. Also three and four after falling 23 to 21 at Washington. I said, don't you lose to the commanders. Don't do it. This, of course, despite the help of a pick six from his D. If they didn't have that pick six, it would have been over. I would have been a wrap. I would have, you know, gone and taken my hike and tried to avoid the rattlesnakes in California way earlier in this game. But this is, again, the first time in Aaron Rodgers' entire career that he's had a losing record at this point of the season. Now, I've said this before. But the more, I, and I'm not smiling about it, it's just I don't want this to end this way for either of them, but the more I see both of those offenses struggle, the more I'm convinced, and it makes me mad, and it infuriates me, that no one is listening to me. These two legends need to start taking things off of their plates. I cannot sit here any longer and tell the Packers to run the ball. I cannot tell Tom Brady enough, Tom Brady who, his entire career is built around defense and running and distributing the ball. The Bucks' offense is absurdly unbalanced. You just thought 50 dropbacks for Brady to just 14 carries for the Bucks' running backs. For the last five games, Brady's averaging 48.4 dropbacks per game. And the record says one and four. That's it. The Bucks. listen, they got the talent. It's not quite working with those guys back yet, but they have the talent to get the passing game going. But they cannot be this one-dimensional. I don't know why it's happening. And for Rodgers, I mean, God damn, I can't say it anymore. I just can't. I can't. I, I, and I don't know if it's the floor. I think it's Rodgers calling the shots there. James Jones comes on our show regularly. Our fan, hold on a second. Our fan duel family. And I say to him, does he have it in him to run the ball, to not take shots? And then these series happen where they should be running and he's throwing and all of that. It's obvious that Rodgers is 
taking it all on his shoulders to fix it and make it happen. I've said for weeks they need to run the football. I don't even know why I'm sitting up here anymore. Like, I quit at this point. I don't even know if I can talk about the Packers anymore. 12, 12 carries. I said here Friday, simplifying the offense means Aaron Jones. They have a tandem. A.J. Dillon, 12 carries. And they did get Aaron Jones involved in the passing game. A couple of beautiful grabs out there. 35 passes for Aaron Rodgers. And to who? I don't even know what we're doing here. I feel like both of these guys are trying to shoulder the load themselves. So the, the question I was musing on this morning is, who's making the decisions? I want to blame LaFleur, and I want to blame, you know, the coaching staff down there in Tampa Bay, everybody involved. But... We all know that it is Aaron Rodgers and it is Tom Brady that have control over these offenses and at the line of scrimmage, and it's them. And you guys both know better, and I love you both. When you've been your most successful, it has not been because you are throwing 50 times a game. It's when you are taking what the defense is giving you and trusting the guys that are around you. I can never give up on either of these quarterbacks, but I th I'm real panic button, like trigger happy. Like, l let's go here. It kind of reminds me of... And they're, you know, Rodgers is, is like a year older than me, so it's not like an ageist thing. But at a certain point, these coaching staffs might have to trick these quarterbacks into not doing so much. And like, listen, my dad loves to shovel the driveway when it's snowing in Chicago, and he loves it. And I, you know, but he's in his 70s, and it's, you know, I have to say, hey, dad, why don't you help me with this paperwork? I don't understand my, my car insurance or health insurance. Can you look at this? And I sneak out and I shovel the driveway, or I convince him somehow, because otherwise, like, my dad's always gonna wanna shovel the driveway. At 85, he'll be out there shoveling. You have to sort of find a way to finesse that situation into doing what's best for the team and that of course is run the ball and stop shouldering everything i basically just called aaron Rodgers and tom brady 80 year old men which is not what i'm saying i'm saying the coaching staff is just as important and just as responsible for what's been going on all right let's talk about oh something happy how awesome is this whole Daniel Jones thing? Because there's been this narrative that he's not great, and there's a narrative that he's a good leader and he's tough, and then there's this narrative that he's just kind of along for the ride and what's going on in the hoopla in New York. And after then beating the Jags 23-17, the Giants doo -doo -doo -doo, are 6-1. and one. And to put that into perspective, guys, they have won six games in an entire season just once since the last time they made the playoffs back in 2016. That is insane. It has been an incredible early season run. We are all here for it. But there has been this feeling that, uh, Oh, like Daniel Jones is fine. It's all Saquon. That it's you know, it's all Brian Dable. Jalen Jones is just there. It's the defense, uh, and I, I will say that's not completely unfair. And I won't say that. But after yesterday, that narrative is dead. More rushing yards than Saquon Barkley. He put the ball in the air 30 plus times. Gorgeous touchdown to Slate, and he converted some key third downs. Ran for 107 as you saw in the score, averaging just under 10, 10 yards per carry. There's still a lot of season left and a lot to be determined as to whether or not uh, the Giants offer him an extension, whether or not he's the future. But what a step in the right direction. He had to do things, he did them, and he did them well. So we continue to celebrate the Giants into week eight, which we love. Um, another big takeaway of mine, and I need to hear yours, because there's so much to chew on here. So Up and Adam Show is our Twitter handle. Get it going. What needs more real estate in our 60-minute uh, program here? Uh, Andrew Hawkins is backstage somewhere probably causing a ruckus and ready to come out here and hang out and party with me to wrap up the rest of, of week seven to get you set for tonight's action as well. Um, but another big takeaway, speaking of wide receivers and Hawkins, is that uh, I'm ready to say the Chiefs officially don't miss Tyreek. I was kind of back and forth on this all year, but I'm ready to admit the Chiefs don't miss Tyreek Hill. Mahomes lit up the scariest defense in the land, in my opinion, the Niners, 423, three scores. He fueled this 44-23 blowout win, but it was even more impressive than that. It really was. He had seven completions of 20 plus yards to four different receivers. The big plays, people, they are happening without Tyreek Hill. MVS and Juju, each over 100 receiving yards in this one. That is the first time Mahomes has gotten 100 plus yards out of two wide receivers in the same game. The first time ever, McCole Hardman was the so-fetch 
of the NFL. We're all trying to make, it's like a, the Kevin White effect. We're trying to make Bacall Hardman happen. And he had himself a day. So cheers to him this morning. He became the first wide receiver in the Super Bowl era with two rushing touchdowns and a receiving touchdown in the second game. This offense looked just as explosive as ever. And you see the chemistry building between Mahomes and these weapons with each passing week. So I'm just going to say this. And Bills fans think I hate him even though I love him. Bills fans, Brian. Don't say it. I'm not saying, I'm saying simply, well, first, watch out for those bangles because they are comfy and looking good. But I will also say, Bill Sanders, don't get too comfortable during this bye week. I'll say that. Don't get too comfortable. You know, as you had it, you weren't playing. Now you've got the, you think you've got the Packers, the lowly Packers next Sunday night. I don't know. We'll get to that Aaron Rodgers uh, and versus Josh Allen for week eight. But uh, later in the show, we'll, of course, hit the Chiefs and the 49ers with our Bay Area friend, Stath. Guys, Stath is coming on the show. <laughs> After that loss, this is going to be a joyous occasion on Up and Adam Show. Don't you guys like my, uh, my jacket? Sunday Night Football reaction. Big takeaways from week seven with Andrew Hawkins in a second. Uh, K dropping the G. Uh, yeah, I apologize for that. Hopefully my nieces and nephews weren't watching about talking about Aaron. I think she's a little far. Just run the, just run the ball. What is, what is so difficult? I mean, you probably don't want that. We got a good one here. Wide receiver with the Browns, former wide receiver and my beloved Bengals, of course. You are oh. the co-founder of something that I need to know more about. It is yes. a sports tech company called Status Pro. Yes. Tell me about that. Status Pro is a sports technology company that majors in virtual reality, augmented reality. We do gaming, we do training products. So our training product, we work with like six NFL teams. Our gaming product just came out, uh, first ever NFL VR game, number one sports VR game what? on the Oculus. Absolutely. Number one game for a month running. So shout out to NFL Pro Era. Make sure you go check that out. Go Where get it. Where do I get? So, I, so that's like something I can ask for for Christmas? That's yes. Like the Oculus? Yes, on the Oculus. I'm into that. Really? Yeah, you can play quarterback in the NFL. So all these things yeah. you're correcting Aaron Rodgers on, Tom Brady. Right, like I could just run the ball. I want to see you do it. I you could can, run the You could the just ball. hand the ball off. If that's what you want to do, you can just run the football. But do you think I'm crazy that they're like, why are they throw, Why is he throwing the ball 32 times or running the ball 12? You have Aaron Jones and AJ. What are we doing? Because that's, that's what they get paid for. You don't pay your quarterback that much money to have somebody else do the work. Oh my you know, God. like I wouldn't come in here and then you wouldn't just say, hey, Hawk, welcome. Take over the show. No. They pay you the big bucks here. To be honest, I thought so about you it. carry the load, okay? <laughs> no, that's why you're here to go over some of this. You're also currently starring in Prime Video's new docu-series, Life After, and that follows the lives of, I think, 12 retired mm -hmm. NFL players. Yep. Uh, and you are one of them. And that's available. We'll get details on that. Yes. <laughs> let's tell do everybody it. Dive when in. it's available. It's available right now, as Marissa says. All right, I want to talk to you about the Bengals. Let's do it. Because I covered some of the things that stuck mm -hmm. out to me, but I think they're back. I think they're back in a big way. Yeah. And the AFC North dumb to let them hang around and develop rhythm and everyone's saying it's against Atlanta they just look better and better every week 500 yards he hung on this Falcons defense what did you make uh, about them after and this is by the way after back-to-back 30-point -back yeah. game so is it fair to say they're that team I don't think they were gone to be back like this is who Joe Burrow has been throughout games, throughout seasons, his college career. He's a slow starter. It is what it is. You can call it slow starting. You can call it him gathering the information to be as best as he can towards the end. He's great in games that way. The Bengals typically sl start slow in games. They started slow last season. So this is just them getting their new rhythm for this season. And to your point, he's Joey B. We've seen him at every level. I would be more surprised if the way they were playing early, where they were kind of out of sync as they were figuring out, if that sustained, that would be a surprise for me. What they're happy, what they're doing now is not a surprise at all. Does it feel like a special team, though? Because there was a certain point, you know, in the offseason, this is a team that went to the Super yep. Bowl, and nobody picked them even to win the division, and the Ravens are a real thing. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I, I'm I almost ready to say they're going back to the Super Bowl. I might say that this I, week. I don't show. think you would be crazy. Ravens right? like, would be the only. They are the returning best AFC team in the NFL. Bills. And what did they do in the offseason? They corrected their offensive line. Right, mm -hmm. And it's going to take a little bit of time to get that rhythm, but what you're doing now, what you're seeing, is them doing just that. The, the receiving core, Joey B, the running game, those things are still intact, and they're still one of the best in the league. And let's not forget, like, I know I, we don't like making injury excuses, but he did, like, have a random appendicitis thing. Yes. That, that could not have been, I'm no doctor, but that no, could that's not, not have been fun. No, that's not fun. But it is Joey, so it's like we just are used to him just being incredible 
all the time. So there, there is no excuses. Last year, actually, that was the most surprising thing for me last season. The fact that he had the year that he did coming off of a knee injury. Because typically when you have those major injuries, yeah. it takes you like a year to like get back into rhythm and, and kind of get your bearings about you. And we didn't see any fall off. Actually, he got better after blowing out his knee, which is just crazy and unfathomable. Eight touchdowns, no turnovers the last two games. Everybody be on notice. Here comes the Bengals. Now we've been talking about the OGs. Brian Barton, my stage manager, said, you know, we got to put the goats out to pasture because it's looking, it's just, oh, it's, not wow. it's not fun to see, but they're struggling. They are. And then let's talk, Aaron Rodgers post game, he did, he did this. What did he have to say? Right now, does. I'm not, I'm not worried about this squad. In fact, this might be the best thing for us uh, this week. You know, nobody's going to give us a chance. Going to Buffalo and Sunday night football, the chance to get exposed. Shoot, might be the best thing for us. What do you make of that? Uh, yeah, I think we were all thinking that, Aaron. Um, I like his cloak. What he's that dressing. Was. He's he's just like a different he's, person every week. He, so he is. He year. is. He's putting more time into that. I see. Is he? Um, so uh, of the so Aaron Rodgers for me, I feel like, and I know you were talking about him, Tom Brady, the goats. I won't call them old, but they're definitely they definitely got to the league before I did, and they're still there well after I've been gone. Very impressive. Um, but I will say for him, I'm a little more worried about him than I am Tom Brady. Okay. Because Tom Brady's 45. He's in a world that we've never seen. Like, your father time will win eventually. I'm not saying that's what's happening, but we know for certain this is the end for Tom. Like, it's coming to that point. Okay. Things are happening. Whatever. It's like, like we should be comfortable with. We that. We should be comfortable with that, right? Like, you. Do you think? Don't it's, get... Do you think it's happening now, though? Let's start. With, you know, in Tampa, you're looking at eight touchdown passes in seven games this. Eight touchdown yeah. passes in seven games this season. I thought that would get fixed when Evans and Godwin returned from injuries. It hasn't been the case, but if we're talking weapons. I'm less worried about Tom because I think they'll eventually figure it out. He'll be Aaron good. Needs to, they need to add somebody. You ready to go? You know, you're no. an OG. You want to get out there and run some routes? No, like, up? like what I just told you about Father Time, I'm not going to be surprised out there yeah. when I'm getting embarrassed by people who are a lot younger and faster than me. That's what happens. Aaron, though. I mean, there was always these questions. He has these MVP years, these great regular seasons. He only has one Super Bowl. At some point, the conversation has to shift to, has he under-delivered and underperformed for what his talent is? Nobody wants to have that conversation. He has the MVPs. Great. Do you really tell me his talent is six Super Bowls less than Tom Brady? I don't believe that's, that's the case. So I think he needs to figure this out because... You change coaching staffs, you change players, you change offensive coordinators. At some point, you have to grab the bull by the horns and take over. But so what ha what needs to happen here? Because you can't, like, we can say yeah. Aaron's at his best when he's got a, a run game. So both of them are. And mm -hmm. Rodgers is averaging the fewest yards in a game in his entire career since taking over for Favre. That was back in 2008. So he's averaging less than 230 yards per game. They need to add someone. I think that's what that bites. Bite when, he's, when he's sitting there and he's saying, I think this is, and he seems very distant, like very even keel. I don't know what that is. It's hot. It's Halloween season. I don't know. That's I'm what absolutely happens. terrified. Freddy don't be Cougar, scared. I'm here. the ghost of Aaron Rodgers in the studio, <laughs> we're talking smack about him. Um, I think he's saying this is what we lost to the Commanders. Yes. I'm. He. He's. He's. I don't know that he's convinced that his level of play needs to be that much better. He used the word tick last week. He said it mm -hmm. needs to be a tick better. But some of those receivers may. You know, it did. They're not catching the ball. They're banged up. I almost think what he's saying here is front office now has to make a move. Maybe I that's think, what he's saying. I think where he's like, you know that's what, what we lost the commander. We've got the bills because they're not wa wanting to bring in a wide receiver. I don't know why, Goody, why they're so allergic to getting him <laughs> to help. It. But they maybe this is what it took, and now he's like, hat tip to our crap performance against the commanders. Now we have Sunday Night Football. Get me the receiver I need. What They, they had the receiver they needed. You know. Like, so what are, you, what are we oh, complaining about? We could have all yeah, right. done better. All the parties in this could have done better to make sure they keep the number one receiver in the league. So I'm sorry. I don't feel bad that now you're saying, oh, it wasn't that easy to replace Devontae Adams. But, but yeah, that's a great point. And I got nothing to say. Adam and Adam, share with your thoughts. What do you, but with Tom, emotionally, how, as a fan, am I supposed to deal with what I'm watching? <sighs> you are you, do, get... you, do you have faith will turn it around now? I think I think he will. I, th I think what you're seeing is, again, the, the game that Tom has played and the reason why he's so good is because mentally 
he is at a different level than the rest of the players in the National Football League. And I think where they're at now, he's 45. He's in uncharted territory, yeah. even for himself. So there's a lot of factors at play here. I don't want to watch Brady, I know. Michael Jordan Wizards jersey it. Like, it, I want to watch I Tom know. Brady it's exit. Tough on top and he almost let a comeback against the Rams last year. He's bleeding from his mouth like I could have been okay with that. And now people are lumping in distractions and drama and stuff into like, oh, this is why he's getting a divorce. It's worth we don't know anything, but it's all perception is reality stuff. Perception and I is hate reality. I hate that that's how it's going and so I would like a perfect ending for him. I can I objectively would. say, and again I've never gone through a divorce, but I know a lot of people who have that sucks. It does weigh on you mentally. It does not matter how yeah. stone cold you are. Like we, if he is going through that, that is something that is on your brain. There is no way Divorce around that. Divorce sucks. That's the kind of analysis you get right here. You get here. it right here on <laughs> Up and Adam Show with Andrew Hawkins. All right, let's talk about the Ravens. We talked about the Bengals. Uh, they had to make it interesting. I don't. I like. Die. Are, they, are they the Chargers? Like, what are we doing in the fourth quarter? It finally gets there, and they have this lead. They always do. Twenty-three to twenty win against the Browns, who almost came back and mm. won it. And this is what Lamar, very fascinating character here in twenty twenty-two. They're here's him after the game. I'd rather not be close. For we'll be around here biting our nails at the end of the game, but um, I feel like it just builds momentum. You know, especially we got this quick turnaround Thursday night um, playing against a tough um, team. Uh, we just got to keep stacking, though. Keep stacking. Hopefully these games don't be so close coming down the nail by. Yeah, hopefully for like my blood pressure's sake. Cause I'm not. <laughs> I'm no young spring chicken. I can't handle this. They've blown three fourth quarter leagues, right? Mm -hmm. They. Uh, all losses, and it looked like it was going to happen. I could yeah. be positive and say, oh, but it didn't happen. They hung on and they won. But should I be worried about this? And why does it keep happening? Man, I think it's kind of connected to the Packers conversation in this way. I think that the offense needs to find new ways to get creative. I actually don't think this offense is really tailor-made for Lamar. I think it, have, it should have developed and matured well beyond what it has to this point. And also, I think on the outside, they don't have a lot of weapons at receiver. And at some point, you know, teams are going to figure this out. And when you get into certain situations, there becomes a time in every single game where playmakers just have to make plays. And if you don't have that to rely on, which is what Aaron Rodgers is trying to insinuate, at certain points, when it just comes down to, I need my guy to be better than their guy, they're deficient in that way, yeah. right? And so after a while, you can only put Lamar in the backfield for a pitch for one. That's a lot of creativity for one yard that I don't think needs to be necessary for what, for what they have. Well said. You know sports. You know business. What, do you, what, what should happen with Lamar? What do you, when you're watching him play, are you as worried as I am on every play is going to get hurt? I'm not as worried because that's the kind of football he plays. I think that as a... In football, just in general, I think the, the position is evolving. And if that means a quote-unquote lower shelf life, and I'm only saying that because that seems to be the thing that everybody is scared of, then it is what it is. Like, you have to do what you have to do for your team at this moment to win football games. And I think everyone needs to be okay with that. Like I said, my point about the Ravens are, if you're not paying the quarterback, you need to pay the wide receivers. Pay, pay somebody. Like, in Aaron Rodgers' case, you have to get used to being the guy because... You're making all the money, yeah. right? In I mean, they case. paid Mark Andrews, didn't they? And he didn't do squat for me yesterday. He zero did. He catches. got zero point four. National in my tight end day my ass. <laughs> yeah, Unintended. Yes. That was unbelievable. I was really not happy We're about on the that. Same page. But I'm saying, how would you have advised him? Like, you're very savvy. I mm -hmm. go to you for advice financially, business wise, especially like with the mix of sports. Like, yeah. How would you have advised him before the season? Honestly, I would. want to talk about it. I, th I think he's done it the right way. I'm I'm going to be honest with you because really? if you look at it, like. At some point, you have to understand who has the leverage and who doesn't have the leverage. The Ravens at the moment, if they say, hey, we're not going with Lamar, we're going to go find a new quarterback, now everybody is on notice. Front office, head coaches, he saved a lot of their jobs when he came on. So if Lamar's looking at it, and whatever the contract is, and I don't know the details, but I can see franchise tag next year gets this amount, Franchise tag the following year gets oh, that the amount. Oh, the Kirk Cousins? Like, what do we wait? Why would I agree to a deal that I know I'm already going to get if Is everything remains status quo? Is he going to play on the franchise tag? If he has to, he will. I think he will. You like what he did. That's a. I think that's I do. A, that's a uh, alternate take. I don't think a lot of people feel that way. Hey, if you're okay with the alternative, you wait. Whoever is willing to wait the longest wins the deal. He wants that guaranteed money. He does.
He does, but he's already got more than he, he bargained for. And he deserves it. We love Lamar Jackson. Just yeah. get the ball to Mark Andrews next time. Thanks. <laughs> All right, we'll be back more with Andrew Hawkins. We're going to go rapid fire through a couple of these games that we didn't get to talk about. Maybe we'll go back to last night. Uh, and we were going to just, yeah, hit the week seven league after this. Bye. I don't even know. That thing is terrifying. Whatever's going on <laughs> with that camera. Victory Monday for the Jets. My goodness, another win. Rob Sala, very excited. That Brees Hall injury, absolutely brutal. But we continue to cheer on both New York teams. This is Up and Adam Show, sponsored by WD-40. Uh, we need to oh, get a wow, check from them. We're going to put it yeah, here. We have a creaky, free. listen, this isn't exactly the newest studio in the world, but I'm just going to, I'm a big supporter of this product, yeah. as Andrew Hawkins is here with us on a Monday. Uh, that was no joke terrifying. Yeah. I thought the entire jib cam was going to fall If you down. wanted my business advice, I would say I would not give free advertising. Get it WD-40. out of here! You pay for it. That's all you get. I give so much free marketing. Yeah, I it's see so that. crazy. I literally do it all of the time. Everyone's like, you must be making so much money. I'm like, mm. uh, Okay, we had so much action happen yesterday. Andrew Hawkins is here, so let's go around the league. It is our week seven roundup rapid storylines right here, right now. And let's start with Dak Prescott, Dak the Cowboys. Back. He was back, and he was hype after the game. Hey, enjoy this day. Enjoy this one, man. But hey, let's get in tomorrow. Let's clean it up. Make sure we're continuing to get better each and every day. Go so grind on three. One, two, three. Grind. Eight. So it wasn't super pretty, but they got the win. Your thoughts on this? Yeah, I was excited to see Dak back. Because I, I, I think, I mean, as great as Cooper Rush did, and I think Cooper Rush did what you want out of a backup. You go in there, you give your team a chance to win, you, you keep them invigorated, you keep guys playing hard. But there are just certain things he can't do that Dak can. Some of those throws that he made against the Detroit Lions you know, kind of reminded everybody, like, oh, this is what you get with Dak. Now, he has to sustain that. I know. But I do think that was a good opponent for him to come back and get his bearings back about him. Cowboys defense, by the way, five turnovers, and they held yes. what had been an, a really explosive, top-notch Lions offense to six measly points. Mm. All right, we saw the Jets' uh, situation, but we want to talk about the Jets still. They're undefeated with Zach Wilson, 4-3-0, and 4-0. and Who cares? Fans are hype. Either way. <laughs> Okay. New York football is back. Isn't it so fun? Oh, it's nuts. I uh, love it. So they're four and zero with Zach Wilson. I was uh, wrong, not three and zero. But people are getting a little hot, like hot takey on him. Yeah. Yeah. Not about like the mom stuff. Don't. I was gonna <laughs> say yes. Take... Let's dive in. Up at Adams, baby. <laughs> don't, don't take me. <laughs> we get it. We get to it here. <laughs> He's Louise. Um, but he had a lackluster, if you will, stat line for the second week in a row. Yeah. And some I've seen on Twitter some Sam Darnold comparisons. No ghost talk, but Ooh, no mono okay. talk. But still, you can't uh, you can't ignore the fact that they are ripping off wins with him under center. Do you think everyone's being too hard on Zach Wilson? Yes. Okay. They're being too hard because they're winning. But most importantly, Zach is not turning the football over. Good point. So if he was turning the football over and he had the lackluster stat line, then I would say, yes, you're right. We could get this out of Joe Flacco if he wanted to. But he's being smart with the football, him being cautious. At some point, he's going to have to get over that hump to take a little bit more chances, a little more shots, and he's going to have to improve that stat line. But as long as he's not turning the football over, because the Jets are very well coached, because they drafted so well, and they have a straight, a good, young, talented football team, he's given them a chance to win. Jets fans, you're so annoying. Because good, you've you. been waiting for so long to have something to hold on to. Yeah. You've got four straight wins, and you would, you would take four wins at any point in the last 12 years, and <laughs> let alone against the Steelers, the Dolphins, the Packers, over the Packers and the Broncos, and you're going to find something to complain because what? Because it's not pretty? Yeah. New Yorkers, you're going to find something to be upset about? And like, like like uh, Vince from uh, Rockaway is going to have an issue on <laughs> AM radio in New York this morning? It's unbelievable. He's leading the team to wins. All right, the Seahawks. I love this Geno thing. Yeah, I, I love, love Geno too. I just like him. It's very hard to rewrite your narrative in the NFL. So when yes. you do, it's amazing. Look at this face. It's a revenge tour. First place alone in the NFC West of all divisions. 37-23 win over the Chargers. I don't want to talk about the Chargers. That was brutal. What impressed you most about him in that win? I mean, he just has such a command of, like, the game, the offense. You get really comfortable in the NFL. Like, honestly, if you think about 
like somebody's NFL career. There's there's obviously a natural talent and ability standpoint, right? And there's just like very little margin between, we'll call it the last guy and the top guy. Right. They're all elite. Most of it comes mentally, especially at the quarterback position. You have to have a, a feel for it. You have to have a control about it. You have to have a confidence for what you're doing with your offense. Now, Gino, who came in as a second-round pick to the Jets, we've seen him bounce around and different coaches, different offenses. And what you're seeing now, he looks like a different player because he's confident. He's out there playing as if he knows what he's doing. He has confidence in his arm, his ability, and that matters so much And Seahawks are reaping the benefit of it. Is it sustainable? And what does it say about Russell Wilson? Yeah, I don't, well, I don't think it says anything about Russell Wilson. I just, but, th I just had to say Yeah, I it. love how we in get it to it here on Up and Adam. In case you had a hot take to just... <laughs> yeah. And what this means for Russell... <laughs> no, I, I think it's sustainable because I, I, I just think overall, like, Gino, the way he's approaching the game, the way the players are rallying around, and the way Pete Carroll is now calling um, these games and leading this football team... I do think it's sustainable. Now, for Russell Wilson, it's the opposite. Right now, it's him and his teammates and his organization and this right. new offense and new head coach and this new place trying to gel something that is so brand new, and that's tough. It's, it really is tough to do, even for as good as Russell Wilson is. If you were, you know, your business again, mm -hmm. what would you do for Russell Wilson? Like, what would you do? Like, the, I mean, the, the Subway commercials are bombing. Yeah, those are not but great. But they're not bombing because everyone's talking about yeah, them. Yes, so those are So wins. when he did Mr. Unlimited, it bombed, but everyone said it in love. Yeah, like, what let's is the bomb? ride. That's the question. That's what I'm saying. So what from your perspective, I know you're not PR, but like business-wise, is there something he could do to sort of fix this disaster that's been happening? Or is it, does it all really start with wins on the field? Would you have him focus that and sort of not do any other advertise like like focus on what's going on in that locker room kind of thing as a fellow a fellow Bengals fan here and in, in their facility there is a quote in from Paul Brown that says winning makes believers of us all so for Russell Wilson for anybody if you win the narrative automatically changes when you don't mm -hmm. you see how quick it goes the other way now the tuxedos seem a little Messed up oh my from God, a quarter step How brothers. Did this happen? Yeah, I like it. I love it. No, you don't. I don't love it. Like really love it. What is that glove? Stop it. <laughs> Even, Do you see this in there? What is this my motorcycle glove? There is if anybody who dresses like that, is that supposed to be scary? <laughs> is that supposed to be someone I'm like afraid of? I don't know what to use. I blame do. the wardrobe staff. Why is he so hated? Huh? Why do people hate him? Because people hate the fact that they have this misconception of what cool is their whole lives, and they hate that this guy is now popular and cool, and they're like, wait a minute, I was told this wasn't cool my whole life. So people are looking in the mirror, and they're getting a glimpse of what they are oh in themselves. God. And they're like, man, why is this guy a star? Because I was told that I couldn't be a star doing the things that he's been doing already. Why do players hate him? I don't think players hate him. You don't? I, I don't think players hate him. I haven't... I, this is the honest to God truth. I've never talked to a teammate of Russell Wilson's that says they hate Russell Wilson. Because mm. he's got teammates who like really stand for him too, like a DK, like a. Yeah, I mean, again, I, I think it's other, it's whatever. You know, everybody's different. Not everybody likes me. But like Richard Contrary Sherman, to popular belief, Richard, K, no, stop. not everyone Richard, likes me. Richard Sherman has something. You know, there's something. There's something there. There's a lot. So who, uh, Richard Sherman, but there might Richard be something Sherman's there. But like, think about I, who there's something with Richard Sherman with everywhere. That's Richard's personality, which I is okay. Say it, Richard. But that's what I'm saying. Like not everybody's personalities mix. Yeah. And that's all right. That's there's nothing wrong with that. And I do think that's more like he. You know, look at he's got this commercial and he's got all the love from the Super Bowl when it was a lot of defensive. You know. Performance, maybe there's something there. Maybe now we're just really just drawing. Being yeah, I don't know what. I don't know where we're going with this. I don't know where the hell this came from. I'm so excited. <laughs> the they really made up for the squeaky uh, camera here. The Titans rode Derrick Henry to their win, right? And their defense, of course, 19 to 10 over the Colts. Now, I talked about this all last week. Nobody's yeah. talking. Nobody ever talks about the Titans. And they're yeah. such uh, Nashville. curmudgeon -y fans about it. But we can't deny it. Four and two, four straight wins, stranglehold on the AFC South. And they were overlooked the offseason, all the other AFC teams. Everyone was talking about the Dolphins and the Raiders and these big mm. moves. Tennessee has been as hot as anyone. Do you see them as a legit threat in this conference? I mean, Delaney Walker hung it up. Nobody even said anything. It was like it happened. Yeah, nobody didn't happen. cared. 
we had him on the show. I care. Did you? Yeah, I love. Okay, him. good shout out. Shout out to Up and Adam. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think I think that they are a threat. They have been a threat for the past however many seasons. You know why? They have the best coach in that division. I am a big Mike Vrabel fan, and Mike Vrabel for me. He gets the most out of all of his teams. Whatever the mix of his team is, he gets that the most. You see that in the way the players fight for him. You see their reaction to him. But you also see his reaction to his players. When things are going great, he makes sure he shows them the love. He takes care of them. I remember the situation where Taylor Lewan had a concussion. He was trying to come back, and Mike Vrabel pulled him back and said, hey, man, you don't have to do this. Like, we're fine. We'll, we'll handle this. Give yourself the time that you need. That is speaks volumes about him, that travels throughout a locker room, and I think for them, they always are a threat because as long as they have a m enough talent, he's going to get the absolute most out of his football teams. You think he's a better coach than Peterson? Peterson, of course, won a Super Bowl, really changing things around there and there in his first year, but they've had stability consistently, like he's got it going. I think he's the, the, the best coach in that division, I, absolutely. Yeah, who's the best coach in the league right now? Best coach in the league. Because the, the, oh, coach, the coaching, is, is really still? Yeah, I can't. What? I can't not give Belichick. I mean. Right now, though, I'm not saying best, best legacy, best career, best. Who's, who's coaching the best this football season? You could say McVay last year. That's a tough one. I need, I need a break. You need a minute? That. All right. I well, can't just I just think some the of names. the coaching decisions this year have been so wonky that I'm. They have been. And it really The matters. game is changing, too. But the, so the Bengals, I'm like, oh, I, they're back. They're, but the only thing that's holding me back, not the offensive line, not Chase pulling up lane. Zach Taylor. Zach Taylor. Well, yeah. I'm like, what, what are you doing? Half the time, I'm like, yeah. hold on to your butt, Samuel L. Jackson vibes. Like, I'm, <laughs> I, because I, I'm screaming at the TV because I think, I think every it's... fan of their team says that about their coach. Really? Though. Yeah. Who do you think is coaching the best right now? I don't know. I always want to say Tomlin, but not. I, I don't. I think They're having the, a rough go. The quarterback thing is, was a little mishandled, I think, yeah. which makes which like hurts me to say. I don't, I don't love know. That. They, they don't have a bunch of great options at quarterback. Can we look at? Can somebody back there in the control room look at FanDuel and say coach of the year odds? I mean, it's. Dable probably is probably yeah, the one. Yeah, definitely probably Dable. Is Dable the best coach in the NFL right now? You is can't tell me no. Coach? Daniel Jones out there outrushing Saquon. Saquon looking Saquon. Yeah, that's, that's hard to argue. I'll give, da I'll give Dable some love. Are they love. six and one? Unbelievable. Yeah, I think it's got, or, I mean, Marissa's saying Nick Sirianni. I was going to say Sirianni. Is, who's number be one there. on FanDuel? Nick Sirianni. Nick Sirianni. Dable. I, I'm not bad at either one who's of those three? options. Oh, Salah. Yeah. Okay. I'd vote for Dable, I think. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I mean, you have such a complete team, though. I go Dayball because we expected the Eagles. I don't know if we expect them to be undefeated, but we expected them to have this kind of a run. Like, looking at their schedule, looking at their team, looking at their talent around them, we all came into the season yeah. feeling like the Eagles were best positioned to, to, to make a little bit of a run. The Giants... Came out of completely nowhere. Yeah. We, uh, we're, we just mentioned FanDuel Sportsbook, so I'm starting to dabble in, like, parlays and all that. Okay. Do you have any advice for me on, like, how to handle any of that? Just, nope. like, no, not at all. All right, well, Hawkins is with me then. Nope. <laughs> we're we're going to kick this thing off together. Uh, you, I know you can tell me about Life After, which yes. is an awesome docuseries. Amazon Prime, tell me about it. Yeah, so uh, Life After follows the transition from NFL football player to after your career. It's produced by Thomas Jones, former Bears running back. Um, he did an incredible job. He reached out to me and said, hey, man, I would love to tell your story and everything you're doing with Status Pro. And it was awesome, man. They came and they followed. They came to my home here in L.A. They traveled to shoots with us in Atlanta. They talked to team members, family members. Um, and I think it was very therapeutic for a lot of the subjects because transitioning from something that you spent your entire life doing, like to play in the NFL, it takes... Not 90%, it takes 100% of your focus from the age of like eight until 30, if you're fortunate to play that long. Um, and so it is tough to say, okay, now it's time to shift that focus to do something different. And all the guys in there kind of talk about that process and it's very different. Everybody's situation is unique. And it's very, it's, it's just a, an interesting proposition to have to change focus of what you've been on your entire life at the age of 30 when you have your whole life ahead of you. So it's very inspiring. I think it's going to help and it's going to, um, inspire a lot of people and uh, specifically athletes who, you know, being an athlete is a, a marriage that is guaranteed to end in divorce. So yeah. as we, you know, kind of spread this more than an athlete gospel, I, I think it's going to help a lot of people. What's the biggest challenge in transitioning? 
Yeah, I think it's just honestly having something no longer a part of your life that is always there. I don't want to call it a crutch because it's a, it's a huge opportunity. But, but you have identity. to realize, like, everything in my life while I was a player revolved around football. It was the longest relationship that I had in my life. I had football longer than my wife, my children. Um, I didn't go on a honeymoon because I had to train. I miss funerals. You miss weddings. You miss Christmases. After Christmas, you never are home for a Thanksgiving. That becomes the norm, right? And so all these things that football makes a decision for no longer being there, you kind of have to recalibrate and, and kind of change this whole thing around. And so no matter how prepared you are, and I like to say that I was probably as prepared as any player who's ever played in the National Football League, even still, it takes you getting used to not being the person that you once were. I think it's your identity for when you're eight and everybody in your family makes sacrifices for you, yes. your, your siblings and everything is, and I, Howie Long put it in a really, inter, not an interesting way, but something that's always stuck with me, he said the clapping stops. Mm. So you're clapped for your yes. entire life because you're an athlete, you're a standout, you're extraordinary, you're unique and special, and then when you retire, unless you're part of a very small 1% group of a, a Brady, a Rogers, a Hall of Fame jacket, yep. the clapping stops, the, the best seats in the restaurant sort of slow down and mm -hmm. stop and halt and you see that over and over again and you need I would imagine the, the biggest tip is support and identity outside of football at some point absolutely it's finding your passion playing. it's finding your passion it's finding the things that you you love to do it's the challenges like making it to the NFL is a personal challenge for every single player and then getting there and trying to be the best you can possibly be and to your point when the clapping stops the challenge is no longer there so you have to find that challenge inside the life of your opportunity as an athlete. So that helps your transition. And I think that's what this, this, this docu-series shows best. It's everybody having found their next challenge and it keeping that competitive spirit going because that's the thing about athletes. We are very competitive and you know, we need to uh, achieve, we need to conquer, we need to, to chase and challenge. And, and I think that's what Status Pro has provided for I was gonna say, me. you've got that with Status Pro. Now, have, you have you taken the honeymoon? Uh, yeah, we did. Okay. We did. Five years late, but we That's did take it. That's all I wanted to know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You better have taken it on the honeymoon <laughs> at some point. All right, we've got staff next on the show to talk about the Niners. He will be unhappy, but I'm happy to see you, Andrew Hawkins. I miss you uh, on, on our old Amazon I days. know. We're going to get the gang back together. <laughs> we Kelly. definitely will. All right. Oh, gosh. Christian McCaffrey in that jersey. Unbelievable. <laughs> Stay calm, Wusa, Om, Rob Stats Guerrero. I will be calm and reasonable. I will be calm and reasonable. That's not why we bring you on this show. Are you kidding me, Stats? The Niners fell 44 to 23. It wasn't pretty to the Chiefs yesterday. And to break down the state of the Niners, no one better than Stats. Stats, no one wants a calm Stats. That's not why we book you to come on the show. Do you understand? Well, can you get me to come on when something good happens? It's always when something bad happens that you ask me to come on. Uh, there's obviously a reason for that. Now, I'm looking, <laughs> uh, I'm looking right now. There's an article that you just posted this morning. And what is it? Did the uh, ha Hold on. Give me one second. It's about Shanahan. Is Shanahan yes. losing the locker room? Your thoughts? Right. So this is the second straight week now where the Niners have had a player publicly call the team out after losing. Last week, it was George Kittle who said... He didn't know if the effort was there from all positions. And this week, Brandon Ayuk said, we've got too many playmakers on the offensive side of the mm. ball to only score 23 points. Who's in charge of both of those things? That's Kyle Shanahan. And the one thing you could say about Shanahan is that he always had the locker room united. Even when they stunk in 2017 and lost their first nine games, they were always playing for one another. Now, in year six, not so sure. This just makes your damn day, doesn't it, <laughs> I mean, there was no part of the team that was good yesterday. No part. The offense stunk. The defense got absolutely Crazy. dog walked by Andy oh. Reid, who ate the 49ers breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It was a master class by Andy Reid. The 49ers are absolutely terrible. And I hate to say it, but you go look at who they've beaten and who they've lost to this year. The 49ers are absolute frauds right now. Oh, I said last week that I thought the CMC uh, edition swung it in their favor in the NFC. Give, give me your, GS, your Jimmy G assessment. There was an interception. I believe he lost a fumble, and he took a safety oh, in did. the end zone. Um, so how much of this falls on Jimmy G? Some of it. I mean, look, that's the Jimmy G trifecta, right? That's the triple crown for Jimmy Garoppolo. I seem to remember a certain host <laughs> who was telling 49er fans how lucky we were to have Jimmy Garoppolo as a quarterback and yet again he throws a crippling interception right before the half when the Chiefs are begging the 49ers to take control of the game after muffing a punt. Niners get the ball at the 12-yard line yeah. and Jimmy Garoppolo yeah. throws a 
stupid interception and the Niners don't get any points. He I seem to remember Kevin. I seem to remember a certain SB Nation host saying, this defense is so good. This defense needs a name. We need to name this defense. It's going to go down in history as one of the best the in the league. Why because are you doing that, the voice, Because you made fun of me, so now I'm shooting back at you because you <laughs> said that. So what happened with this defense? They could not get off the field on third down. Mm. The Chiefs had a third and 20, and they threw a screen pass to Jet McKinnon. They picked up 34 yards. They scored. The 49ers battle back. It's a one-score game in the fourth quarter. Third and 11, Patrick Mahomes throws a 57-yard bomb to Marquez Valdez-Scantling, who runs right past Mooney Ward and absolutely cooks him, and the Chiefs ultimately go on and score on that possession. The defense was terrible yesterday. Absolutely terrible, especially on third and long. Christian McCaffrey, let's make something something of nothing, right? There's the, that's a bright spot. I would have maybe liked them to use him a little more. I heard a little birdie told me that he would be used only in red zone packages. That wasn't super the case. So do you think that he sort of may, bolsters them a little bit? And let's not forget, they've got a get-right game against those Rams who get dog-walked, in your words, to use the parlance of your times, uh, by Shanahan all the time. Yeah, it's great. He could beat one team. That's fantastic. He's 5 and 0 in the regular season against the Rams since 2020. He's 14 and 21 against everybody else in that time. You have to be able to beat other teams and you have to be able to win more than one way. And the the proof is in the pudding. And the 49ers, you only have to watch the first half of their games. When they are not leading after the first half, they never win yeah. under Kyle Shanahan. It's it's bad. You can only win one way and when it doesn't go that way, they don't do it. They're winning the division, you clown. They're not going to win the division. They're going to lose to the they're Seahawks? Not, they're going to lose to anybody. The 49ers they're can lose to anyone at any time. Who's doing less with more than Kyle Shanahan and Jimmy Garoppolo? None of right that now? matters. You don't, it's the NFC. Rams are shaky. Seahawks, I don't despise sustainability-wise. We got to go. They're counting me down. But I, I love you, and uh, you're not a clown. <laughs> I don't know why I said that. But I love you, Stats! It'll I get love better. you too, Kay. Get a win over the Rams. <laughs> Big thanks to Andrew Hawkins for coming to studio. We love in-studio guests tomorrow. Tom Curran recaps Patriots and Bears. And we've got Darius Butler and Mark Ingram, too.